So today, like I said, we're going to uh, really kind of relaunch our look at the book of Acts. Um, we're calling the series Unstoppable, a journey through the book of Acts. And um, the title really kind of of the sermon today is What If? And so now we're back after that little break to a series on the book of Acts called Unstoppable. And I tell you, I'm still not looking forward to it. I told you that last time, I'm not looking forward to it, but here goes. So a lot of material we're going to cover today, but hey, take in what you can. Go back and read the first chapter and reread the first chapter and reread it and try to absorb and try to remember as we go on this journey together um, what the book is all about. Last time, I told you why I'm calling it unstoppable because there's one scene in the Gospels where Jesus um, addresses his disciples and he says these words that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. That's Matthew chapter 16. And the book of Acts actually tells the story of how the Spirit of God came to indwell and forever change this unlikely raggedy bunch of disciples and how against all odds they became the church and in that they were unstoppable to spread the gospel message of Jesus and all that he'd done for us. Now, in our study, I also mentioned that I have this personal theory that as we work through the book, that we can find either direct quotes or references or allusions to every other book uh, in the Bible. Now, I don't know if that's true, but like every preacher, I think I can probably find something even if it's not there. And you might get a taste of that today because you know what this is. This is my checklist of the books, that, of all the books of the Bible that I've made that I can check off as we go through the book of Acts just to see if Luke, in his recording of what we call 28 chapters of the book of Acts, actually does make allusions to, quote, or somehow allude to every other book in the Bible. And it's odd that I would think that until you start to get into the first chapter. And you see where he's going with all this. He's a Gentile. Why does he care about the Hebrew Scriptures? And yet he does. And so as we work through the book too, I mentioned last time that one of the things that I want to do besides discover if he, he does mention in some way every other book of the Bible, we will take some excursions away from the book. We'll come up on a topic, maybe even a town or a church or one of the books, and we'll just take an excursion away from the book of Acts for a little bit, and we'll talk about that book or that place, or whatever it may be, just to give everybody a break from the book. Because Luke, when he writes, he just writes, as you'll see, he writes massive amounts of material. He only writes two books in the New Testament. But it's a huge, just like 28 or 30 percent of the entire New Testament in two books. He's a physician, and he is obsessed with details, as you'll see when we go through the book. Um, and so he's just a masterful writer, and we're going to take note of all of those kind of things. So I have a theory, and we're going to take some excursions. And last week, I, or last time, I said that our goal was just to introduce the book and to hit some highlights from chapter one and then to offer a challenge, building some bridges along the way to kind of suck us in, to draw us in to the story. Today, I want to do the same thing. I just want to go a little bit deeper into Acts chapter one. So this is introduction part two. Acts gives us a fascinating and unique glimpse into the world of the early church, and to see the foundations of our own faith. And that's the bridge that, that brings us to the story, that allows us to have a part in that story. 
And it's not just a story, it, it's, it's history, but it's even more than, than history. Like I said last time, this is, this is redemptive history of how an unstoppable God worked in the lives of average, ordinary, everyday people just like you and me. And as redemptive history, it's more than history because it's history on fire with every twist and turn throughout the book that you can imagine. It'll grab your attention. Some places it'll trigger your imagination. It'll tug at your emotions until we're changed just like they were changed by the same spirit that began to work in their lives so that they could take, so that we can take the unstoppable message of an unstoppable God and his unstoppable Christ in the power of his unstoppable spirit to a world that one day will be stopped dead in its tracks without hope otherwise. That's our mandate. That's our mission. That's where we're headed in the book of Acts, that we could be a church that is unstoppable because we're part of the story being driven by the Holy Spirit to take what's in here out there. We said the author last time of the book was this guy named Luke. I already mentioned it. And uh, he was a medical doctor by trade, but he turned historian and missionary companion of Paul we see that in the book, uh, but it takes until we get to chapter 16 um, because of how the pronouns are presented in the book. All of a sudden in chapter 16, there are these passages that begin with we, and then we did this, and then we did that, showing that Luke has joined Paul's traveling band, his missionary endeavors. And so this same Luke, he writes the Gospel of Luke. So there's a, a close connection between the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, Acts, the book, is the sequel to the book of Luke. And it's like one work um, total, but it contains two parts, two books. And it was written to this guy named Theophilus, who was probably... Um, a high-ranking educated official within the Roman system and somehow Luke came to know him being a Gentile and being educated and probably somewhat wealthy he would have maybe traveled in the same circles and he met this guy named Theophilus and Theophilus was either a pre-convert or a convert of Luke's if nothing else he was he was a seeker or maybe he was just a young Christian we don't know and Luke is writing this account about everything that Jesus began to do and then how Jesus began to work through the life of the church and the power of the Holy Spirit so that Luke would be better informed. As a matter of fact, that's part of his purpose. That's part of Luke's purpose in writing. Part one, the Gospel of Luke, was written to tell Theophilus the story of all that Jesus began to do and to teach from his birth to his resurrection. And then part two, which is the book of Acts, just continues the story, the truthful story, of everything that happened. Because apparently, if we read the prologue of the book of Luke, where he starts it all, there are many other people that are writing stories about Jesus. Luke sets out to tell the true story of how all of this came about. So historically and geographically, that's how Luke does it in the book. How the church began and how it grew, how it was infilled and empowered by the Holy Spirit after Jesus' ascension so that Theophilus would know the truth about how it all happened and, how, and, and was continuing to happen. And that makes Acts 1.8 really key to the movement of the whole book um, as the disciples are empowered by this Holy Spirit, they were first to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. So that's the model. That's how all of this is expanding, and Luke is writing to tell that story that would lead the gospel ultimately to the capital city itself, to Rome. Theologically, uh, Luke wrote to validate Christianity as a legitimate development of God's plan and program for both Jews and Gentiles as engineered by the Holy Spirit to show 
the continuity between what God had promised Israel through covenant and prophecy and what the church had received. In other words, everything that God did spoke and promised to Israel in the Old Testament and under the Old Covenant. He was still doing it now. It was just expanding to the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, it was always supposed to be that way. God was giving Israel revelation of himself, and they weren't supposed to keep it to themselves. They were supposed to share it. Now the story continues. God is doing something new with something old, and Luke is writing to tell that story, to make this connection, to show that this is one continuous story. How ironic, he writes two books, one work, two books, two parts, and we're studying the continuation of the story, and that's exactly what he's doing, Old Testament to New Testament. Do you see what he's doing? He's making the connection. He's saying what God is doing now in the Gentiles is actually legitimate, and it's an outgrowth of what God began to do among the Jews as they worshipped him. And so what he does is he carefully demonstrates God's promises to Israel and that they haven't been exhausted just because God is doing something new, and we call that the church age. This is the time when God is working with the church. Doesn't mean Jews can't be a part. Obviously, they were the first believers, and they, are still, they still can be a part. But now this is really expansive. In other words, if Luke is a Greek or a Gentile, I mean, to the Jew, you know there's two classes of people. You're either Jew or you're Gentile. That's it, no matter what your, your ethnicity. And so Luke is a Gentile, and he's writing to another Gentile. And he's saying, this is how God is now working with our people. It was this way, but now everything has changed. And believe me, it's made it all the way to Rome. And so Luke is very careful, detailed, just telling the story of how all that happened in this continuity. And... and, and in doing so, though, he has to say that, you know, there's just a Jewish remnant that they've actually put their faith uh, in the Messiah. But at large, the nation still stands in opposition. Israel still stands in opposition to Christ. But that at some point in the future, Israel will acknowledge Jesus as their Lord, Savior, and King, whose kingdom will one day fully come. In other words, everything that Israel had always been looking for. Jesus filled partially in his first coming. It will be fully fulfilled in his second coming. In a time when the Jews' hearts will be turned back to God. For right now, they're really struggling with this idea of this Jewish Messiah named Jesus who was put to death. And who skeptics say... Uh, really didn't raise from the dead, and so we choose to believe them, the Jews would say. We don't like this Messiah because he didn't do what we wanted him to do, and so their hearts became hard. And Luke, in the honesty of his reporting, the history of all of this, is very careful to include even the ugly side of men's hearts played out through the Jews. Now, that's something that Luke deals with very carefully because one of the themes that dominate both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts is this idea of placidity. He's very placid. Luke likes to keep things calm. He doesn't want to get things all stirred up. The ironic thing is this. The book of Acts should stir you up. I mean, the stories are crazy. And they're awesome about God's power. But you have to think of the context of the time in which Luke is writing. He doesn't want to present Christianity in opposition to Rome. Because it's not. As a matter of fact, he writes as a part of his purpose this book as an apologetic. It's an argument in defense of Christianity to prove that even while the Jewish leaders consistently opposed this movement from the start and Roman civil um, authorities uh, put Jesus to death, they, in every scene, do not oppose what's happening. And we'll see this unfold like in court scenes and city scenes. So what am I saying? 
Luke has to find a way because of how he likes to write and the way that he wants to present the message so that it can be received by Theophilus and in general the Roman world by not presenting it in opposition to the Rome political machine. What he does is he says, I know the Jewish people, the leadership. They don't like this at all. As a matter of fact, their leaders work with your leaders to get our leader put to death. But he rose from the dead. And now we're the living remnant of what all of that means. And as we live and work and move and expand this gospel, pressing it to the furthest reaches of the Roman Empire, we want you to know that everywhere we go, we just go about doing good, just like Jesus said. We're about changing men's hearts. We're about changing, changing women's hearts, not overthrowing the kingdom. And every time one of our people goes to court, in a Roman court, they can't find anything wrong. So Luke takes the bad of all of that and he says, look, we're not doing anything illegal here. As a matter of fact, what he wants to do is he wants to show that Christianity is a logical conclusion to Judaism, which is an accepted religion in the Roman Empire. So in all of that, Luke is saying, look, I would really like it if the Roman Empire would recognize Christianity as a legal religion. Therefore, we won't have to fight at every turn because Luke is placid. Apparently, that's a reflection of his personality. He wants to present this in a way that doesn't turn people away from the story of what God is doing. And how easy would that be? I just try witnessing to somebody about Jesus sometime and see how quick they shut you off. This was a hostile environment, not unlike our own. Uh, except um, in this country. Uh, they don't necessarily yet put us to death. They're putting people to death. As a matter of fact, the reason the Jewish people had to always appeal to Rome was because under Roman rule, Jewish people had no authority to put somebody to death. If they did, they were breaking Roman law. So they were all the time pushing people the Romans' ways to try to get them, um, you know, incarcerated or put to death or whatever just to silence the movement and Luke is writing to say no Theophilus this is how it's really happening now the now the cool thing and the sad thing at the same time is is that even though the gospel spread and we read about it in the book of Acts and Luke is writing to say hey accept this we want this to be acknowledged by Rome as a legal you know move of God a legal religion they were very religious people by the way even though their gods had fallen out of favor with them and they worshiped the emperor too um, you know we want this to be accepted and it took three centuries but it was but then guess what politics got involved <laughs> the church yeah had to go underground they became persecuted and uh, actually uh, they they grew but they also became very contaminated because whenever you try to mix too much politics and religion uh, that's exactly that's exactly what happens here this is fresh this is new and Luke is saying guys this is about changing people's hearts that's how we overthrow the kingdom we're going to make Rome better because we're going to make its people better so Theophilus get a hold of this so you say how did Luke put all this together? How did he know all this? He had sources. He probably learned it from Paul and his, and his own travels. And in his own travels, especially while, Paul, while Paul's in jail, which he seems to be a lot in the book, he's either in trouble, getting stoned, getting beat up, kicked out of town, whatever. He just has a hard time, gets knocked off his ride. Just all kinds of bad stuff happens right from the very beginning, almost with Paul because he was a deplorable <laughs> at the start and everything turned all around for him. Right, Through all of this, Luke gets information from Paul, master teacher, but then, while Paul's in prison, he travels around, and he goes to the sources. 
He goes to eyewitnesses of the things that happened. I'm totally intrigued by this. Here is a Gentile person going to Jewish sources to get the story of the Jewish Messiah. And he does it so masterfully translating what is, what is spoken in Hebrew into the Greek language so that everybody could understand it. You, the only way you can understand this is to say that it's the providence of God working in the life of Luke. I mean, his style is beautiful. He's the greatest historian maybe that ever lived. Historians say that. I didn't say that. Just because of his attention to detail, his history writing style, all of those kinds of things, they all play into this idea. I mean, he's sincere. He's real. He has conviction. He gives first-hand accounts. When it comes to the book of Luke, he's writing in Greek, but if you've studied Hebrew, what you see underneath the Greek is the Hebrew oral tradition played out. Anybody that knows both of those languages in that day, and some would, would know how accurate his reporting was. If his Greek is ever awkward, it's because he can't figure out a way to translate Hebrew into Greek according to Greek writing style. That's the only reason. And there's places where that happens. Not so much in the book of Acts, but a little bit more in the book of Luke. Because he is so in tune with the details. Because as a writer, he is so compelling. Historians say, this guy, Luke, he stands head and shoulders above everybody else. And so because of his authenticity and, and his sincerity, it draws us into the story as we read stories with themes like this, the sovereignty of God and the founding of the church and the spread of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit for all who believe, the importance of prayer in the life of the church, the importance of the preaching of the word. I mean, Acts contains a bunch of sermons and speeches. As a matter of fact, there are eight sermons or speeches by Peter and nine by Paul. And there's one really long sermon by Stephen and then there's a short sermon by a guy named James. And we'll find out more about who this James is uh, at a later time. And I think it forms maybe about 28 or more percent of the book. About oh, not quite a third, a little over a fourth of the book. Maybe even more. Just sermon material. So there's prayer, there's sermon, there's sovereignty of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and it also records the reality of opposition and suffering uh, in the spread of the gospel. And it shows how the early church was organized, how they lived, how they dealt with problems as they grew numerically, geographically, and cross-culturally. I mean, the church, everybody says, you know, we need to be uh, like the church in the book of Acts. We need to be like the early church. They were just as jacked up as we are. You've got to read this stuff honestly. They had every kind of problem just like we do. This wouldn't be honest reporting if they were presented as being perfect as a church. There were a bunch of people and they had a bunch of problems. And they were all trying to come together and reconcile what these problems were. And deal with them now in what God was doing in a way that God would have them to do it. To guard the truth of these eyewitnesses that had shared with Luke. And now that the world was learning about that Jesus was the Messiah who came to save the world. They killed him, but they couldn't keep him down. He rose again. Man, that's gospel good news. That means you don't have to fear death anymore. That means you can overcome this stinky life that we live right now. Because if we're honest, some days are just not all that good. And they faced the same thing in those days. This was the hope. This is why the gospel is good news. It's good news that we don't have to live like we used to, and we can be alive to God, and we can live a better quality of life, and we can live, actually, forever. And the Greeks, the Gentiles, they had shady stories of what it was like after you died. Some believed you just went nowhere. You just died. And others believed you just muddled around in the murky underworld. They didn't really know. There was a lot of suspicion and a lot of fear about death. And Jesus' resurrection takes all that fear away. It's good news. If you want to talk about the character of the book, and then we're getting ready to actually get into chapter 1. Essentially, even though the outline is, you know, geographical, what Luke does in writing is this. 
he presents Peter and Paul as equals as apostles. If Peter is the chief apostle at the start, as Luke writes, he also presents Paul as an apostle. Peter, an apostle to the Jews. Paul, an apostle to the Gentiles. And this is the truth about how all of that happened. But in the process, he records their mistakes, their successes, their discouragements, their doubts, and their victories. It's a book about regular people who gave their life to God, who got knocked down, but they got back up. Its stories are not necessarily normative. In other words, we don't pattern everything about these stories on what we see in the book of Acts. Like they sing songs, we need another Pentecost. There's, not, there's only one Pentecost. <laughs> you can't recreate that. That was a sovereign move of God for a one-time event. But we can enjoy the benefits of all of that. As a matter of fact, it's a promise to all of God's people to experience what they first experienced there. But we don't get together and try to recreate it. It's a one-time thing. God giving birth. Reality to the church after, they had, after the people of God had waited and waited and waited like a pregnant woman waits. You know there's a baby there. You don't know when it's coming and God shows up sovereignly and the baby is delivered. It's called the church. And once the baby starts to crawl, that kid is unstoppable. They never stop. You want him to walk? That changes everything too. Then you got to be on him all the time, right? That's the book. That's the church. It's not a book of how-to. This is important. It's not a book of how-to necessarily do church. Although it does give us some patterns, it's a book about what if. What if all of this is true? What if? What if? What if even if we got knocked down, we could get back up? What if the church really is? unstoppable. And that's where we're going to start our journey real quick. Oh my goodness, through the first chapter of the book of Acts. So I'm going to outline the whole book as we go through it. And the first eight chapters basically talk about the Jerusalem witness. Remember the geographical expansion of the church. And it's going to begin then in Jerusalem. And that's where, uh, that's close to where Acts 1 picks up at. So here's the prologue. First three verses. You guys ready? Acts chapter 1. I don't want to do this. Here we go. In my former book. What book is that? Somebody was awake. Thank you. In my former. Oh, by the way, <laughs> check the first book off. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus, his focus, and it's not like Jesus stopped doing things. Notice what he says. It's about all that Jesus began to do and teach. It's not like Jesus ended with the Gospels. His work is just now being carried out by someone else. The Holy Spirit. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Just like I said before in the fourth chapter of my, of my first work to you. Of part one, the Gospel of Luke to you. Where Jesus goes into the synagogue and he opens up a scroll and he reads from Isaiah 61. Another book checked off my list where he's going to go around and he's going to do good. He's going to set the captives free. He's going to heal the sick. He's going to bind up the brokenhearted. That's what Jesus began to do. That's how Jesus began to teach. Because after he read from Isaiah 61, he rolled the scroll up and he set it down. And then he said these phenomenal words. Today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, the work that Isaiah talked about begins. Everything that I'm going to do and everything that I'm going to teach is going to start from right here in this. That's what I wrote about you at first. Until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit, one of Luke's foci, to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing, proof, convincing proofs. Eyewitnesses are important to Luke that he was alive. 
just like the ones in Mark 16. All of those evidences of eyewitnesses. There's another book checked off. He appeared to them then over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom. Now, 40 days may not mean too much to you, but you know in the Bible that 40 means a time of completion. 40 years, <clears throat> 40 days, doesn't matter. That's what God is talking about. Here it's a literal 40 days. The children of Israel, you know, they were, they were in the desert for 40 years. There was a time of waiting on what God was ultimately going to do for them. So between Passover and what's going to happen in chapter 2, 40 days had elapsed. Ultimately, between Passover and what happens in chapter 2, 50 days elapse. Now, Jesus appears after his resurrection for 40 days to them, which could mean that <clears throat> there's 10 days until what happens in chapter 2, or it could mean that there's 7 after his resurrection. A week from now, other things are going to start to happen. But in the meantime, Jesus, for 40 days, has been appearing he didn't stay with them. He would just show up and begin to teach them about the kingdom of God. And this is ultimately important in the book. So remember, Luke is writing to this educated buddy to say, I want you to believe. I want you to understand. I want you to experience what I've experienced. And if you're going to understand anything about Jesus, you've got to understand that there are these eyewitnesses, and they've seen things, and they've experienced things. Something has happened then that's changed the course, not only of their own lives, but the course of the entire world. These witnesses to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus are changing everything because they've been changed. These very simple people are doing supernatural things. These very broken people, God has displayed now his beauty in them, and you need to pay attention to them, my friend. These are the witnesses, because what if this is true? What if this is true? And then Luke goes on to show some continuity between the Old Testament, just like we said at the, uh, in the introduction, probably both parts of my introduction. He, he starts to talk about the promise of the Father. He says, on one occasion, while, while he, Jesus, was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait! For the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about in what people 2,000 years from now are going to call Luke 24. For John, and remember John is the prophet like Elijah who was going to come and usher in a whole new age according to the book of Malachi. Check. Oh, by the way, Elijah's found... Um, in the book of 1 Kings, so there's another book checked off. We're going right through the Old Testament here and the Gospels, right? So, listen, John is going to come. There's going to be a promise that's going to happen. you got to go to Jerusalem, wait for it, and here's what it's going to kind of be like. For John, who's like Elijah, who was promised to come to usher in the new age, baptized with water, but in a few days, a week or ten days, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. In other words, just like John baptized, which was a physical evidence of something that had happened internally, so the Spirit is going to come and baptize you. Something that happens on the inside is going to show forth on the outside. Do you see, if you know the second chapter of the book of Acts, you know, you see how Luke is so masterful. He's setting us up to see what happens in the second chapter and in other places in the book of Acts. What God is doing is going to be undeniable. There's going to be a physical expression that demonstrates what's happened to these people on the inside. And so this is where we, we join the story because they, they have to wait for this gift. This is where they join in the story. This is where we join in the story, waiting for God to do something. Because like them, in our hearts, we yearn for something bigger, to be part of something bigger. And that's what they were doing. They were yearning to be part of the redemptive history of what God was doing. And we do the same. Like they were so happy that Jesus was alive, we too want to know that God is alive and well in the world. And our passion then, like their passion as part of the Jewish family is to be part of a family on mission. And so together, like them, we're waiting on God to do something. 
And that's always how God works. Whenever he's going to do something big, he makes his people wait. You know, obviously, I mean, we don't know how long Adam and Eve were in the garden, but God created Adam and Eve. He made a family out of them. It's not good for a man to be alone. And he says, listen, I'm going to give you a mission. You're going to rule over the world that I've created for you. And then sin entered the picture and everything went south in Genesis chapter 3. And God begins to work with, then a few chapters later, a guy named Abraham. He says, Abraham, you are an idolater. I'm going to call you out of all of that. And guess what? I'm going to give you a family, but you've got to wait for a long time until you're really old. This family becomes Israel. And God says, I'm going to do great things to you, but you've got to wait. You've got to go into captivity for a long time, but I'm going to set you free. I'm going to do something new. And that, when he does that thing called the Exodus, when he sets God's people free and he leads them to the promised land, that is the central event of the entire Old Testament. That God is going to take broken, in bondage people, and he's going to set them free, and he's going to lead them to the promised land. It's the same story that we read about in the New Testament, cast in different ways. Luke is saying what was promised before is going to happen now again in its fulfillment in you, and you're going to carry the message forward as we all together go towards the promised land. But you've got to wait. Remember, your forefathers... When Ezekiel wrote, he said, hey, listen, there's going to come a time when I'm going to give you a new heart, God would say, and I'm going to put my spirit within you. The spirit's not going to just come on you, but the spirit is going to be within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to obey me. You shall be my people and I'll be your God. I'm going to do something new in your heart on the inside. This is a description of what God was doing. And they knew about it. And then Jesus comes along and says, well, okay, all right. Listen, here's what I'm going to do, John chapter 14. I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to give you another helper, and that's going to be the Spirit of God. And he's going to be with you forever. You know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. Like, you already are familiar with the Holy Spirit. He comes and he goes, it seems like. But now he's coming to stay. But you have to wait. And so what Jesus is saying is that the spirit that was promised in the Old Testament, you know about him, but you have to wait. He's coming to dwell within you. And this is so exciting for them. They take the next logical step and they ask this question, verse 6. They gathered around him and they said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Of course they would ask this question. These are Jewish disciples. And the kingdom of God in the most Jewish gospel, which is the book of Matthew, writes all about the kingdom. They're Jews. They're interested in the kingdom. So it seems like a perfectly logical question. And Jesus told them about this long-awaited kingdom the whole time he'd been with them. And then he shows up for 40 days and he still talks about the kingdom. Of course, they're Jews. They're looking for the kingdom of God to come. And so they say, it is the time right now. I mean, after all, Jesus, that's what everybody's waiting for. Plus, you've been talking about this the whole time. We know when the Spirit comes, that has something to do with the coming of the kingdom of the Messiah. So Jesus, let's get this thing on the road. Is now the time. And Jesus, instead of saying, yeah, it's it's right now, it's going to happen right now, he says, you have to wait. And he gives them a commission. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that my father is set by his own authority. In other words, God is sovereign. Don't lose your focus, guys. You have a job to do in the meantime. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's interesting because he goes back and reverts now to Old Testament language, the Holy Spirit coming on them. Historically accurate because when the Holy Spirit comes on them, that's an outward manifestation of what happens on the inside. And everybody will be able to see it. In other words, there'll be a sign that accompanies the coming of the Spirit and what God is going to do. And you will be my witnesses of Jesus' story in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the model. This is the movement. This is the outline for the book. So the story begins... And this traces the movement of the book. 
And the thing that we're tempted to do is think that this is really called the Acts of the Apostles because that's the traditional name of the book, but this is really the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the lives of the Apostles. So the hero is not Peter and the hero is not Paul. The hero is the Holy Spirit lifting Jesus up in the lives of everyday people who are just on mission. Verse 9, the ascension. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. I think Luke includes this detail to stress the personal witness aspect. These guys saw Jesus taken up personally. They saw it. I know it's crazy, but they saw it. And it wasn't just one. It was a bunch of them. They saw it. And they went up, and then look what happened. And a cloud hid them, hid him from their sight. Most Commentators say this cloud is probably a representation of the Shekinah glory of God, the manifest presence of God that appears in places like Exodus chapter 40 in the Old Testament or in other books of the Old Testament like when the temple is being dedicated and the priests go in and begin to worship God and all of a sudden the presence of God shows up in the cloud and they all fall down and everybody has to go home the service is over because the presence of God is so strong to Jewish people to see the glory of God hide Jesus is awesome and they actually saw it can you believe it I know it's outside the box but these guys saw it if I were telling the story to try to convince somebody I would do everything that I could to make sure that I didn't say anything that seemed impossible. Which seems to argue for the case that because Luke is telling this, and because it seems so impossible, it must be possible. Why would I tell you otherwise? This is crazy. But these guys, they saw it. They saw it. They were looking, it says in verse 10, intently up into the sky as he was going, just like the prophets of old. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. Like, Habakkuk is fed up with everything that's going on. And he's standing on the rampart and he's looking for God. He's looking intently out into the distance for God. Like, God, when are you going to do something about this? Peter writes about it too. Another book. In his first epistle, he writes about how the, how the prophets, they strained to look into this thing called salvation that they couldn't fully understand. Jesus is presenting these men, the apostles, as prophets as well. People who are spokesmen for God based on what they've experienced and upon what they've seen. When suddenly two men dressed in white, just like at the tomb, Theophilus that I wrote about in chapter 24 of my first work. Two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, that would refer to the eleven, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, and, and Luke probably uses heaven here instead of God, taking back to God, because of Jewish sensibilities, they, they would shy away from saying even God. So, you've been taken back to heaven. He'll come back in the same way that you've seen him go into heaven. I mean, Enoch went up, but he didn't come back. Elijah and Moses, they went up and they came back, but they only were seen by a couple people. They may come back at the end, but this same Jesus in the same way, with all of his glory going up, you're going to see him coming back. As a matter of fact, Paul will write later that every eye will see him and every tongue will confess on that day that Jesus Christ is Lord. When he reappears in all of his glory after his suffering, the same way that you've seen him go up. He's going to come back. And that's the promise of a coming kingdom when Messiah comes again. But for right now, you have to wait. Guys, listen. It's almost here. It's almost already. It's not quite. It's near, but it's not yet. And in all of this, it's really just the beginning of something new. It's not the end of something old. It's the beginning of something new. But nothing can go forward until Jesus goes up and the Spirit can be sent down. And nothing goes forward until Judas is replaced. They have 11 but they need 12. Why? Because every person counts. In this endeavor, every person counts in the story of God's family on mission. What if we really thought that every person counted? What if we really, what if we thought everybody counted? And so what did the apostles do? Verse 12, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, which is east of the city across the Kidron Valley. 
a Sabbath day's walk. <laughs> Jewish sensibilities, Jewish sources. Jewish people couldn't walk any more than, you know, a certain distance on the Sabbath because then it's work and you're violating the Sabbath. It's probably about, if you take the middle of what the requirements were based on different sources, it's probably about five-eighths of a mile. It's like one kilometer if you're in Europe. That's all they could walk. That's about how far they went. They walked from the Mount of Olives back to the city, and when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they had been staying, probably since Passover. It was probably the wealthy lady Mary's home, who's associated with Barnabas, who is a rich guy uh, from another part of the world that we'll find out later about in the book, and John Mark. These were wealthy people. She opens her home, lets them go into this luxurious upper room reserved for wealthy people, away from the fray so they can figure out everything that's happening to them. She opens her home. Women, pray, play, uh, women um, play a prominent role in the whole spread of Christianity. And here is a woman who opens her home. She's not even mentioned yet. And yet she's opened her home. That's where they've been staying for a long time. This room is probably in the upper city. That's the only place where they've ever found any archaeological um, evidence that these uh, wealthy homes existed, uh, homes, uh, homes of wealthy people existed in the upper city near the temple. So that's probably where they were, in an upper room near the temple. They're up there staying, and those present, this is like, it's a business meeting, but it's not. Those present were Peter and John, and James, and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Eleven of them. They all joined together constantly in prayer. Remember, that's one of Luke's themes. Prayer. Along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and this is the last time she's mentioned in the New Testament. And with his brothers. This is astounding. The leaven plus the women and Jesus' brothers. Like, what in the world? Everybody counts. These guys didn't even believe in Jesus when he was walking around on the earth as a man. I mean, everybody counts, right? The main men and the not so main men. The main women and the not so main women. Even family counts in the kingdom. And I know that's probably the hardest of all. Yeah, these guys believed. They thought Jesus was crazy. They didn't believe that he was the Messiah, John 7, 5. And they thought he was out of his mind according to Mark chapter 3. His resurrection, though, apparently convinced them otherwise. And James, who was the next oldest brother, whole story in and of itself, I'll talk about him later, he apparently needed extra special attention, and so Jesus showed up to him personally, according to 1 Corinthians, another book, chapter 15, verse 7. But the main emphasis wasn't on who was there, but on what they were doing. They were praying. All of these people got together, and they prayed. And that becomes the mark of the early church. When they were fearful, fearful, they prayed. When they were confused, they prayed. When they were waiting for God to fulfill his promise to them, they prayed. When they needed an answer to a question, for, such as who would replace Judas, what did they do? They prayed. Here's the first speech. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. He stands up to draw attention to himself because in those days the teacher sat down and the students stood up. He, he models himself to draw attention to what he's getting ready to say after what Jesus had done in John's Gospel, chapter 7, during the Feast of Tabernacles. At one point during the feast, Jesus stands up and he begins to talk about how he is fulfilling what's happening in the Feast of Tabernacles even right now. Peter stands up to draw attention to the fact that what is happening right now is Jesus doing. We're right in the middle of everything that God is doing. It's not even so much to draw attention to himself, but to draw attention to the message and what is about to happen. And in that room, there are about 120 believers. So it's expanded now. They're, come, they're beginning to come together. And he said, brothers and sisters, there's the family language. The scripture, notice his appeal. He doesn't say, this is my opinion. He appeals to the scripture, the Old Testament scripture, continuity again. 
He says the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David. His life is recorded in First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and a lot of other places in the Old Testament. I probably just now already filled up the Old Testament in the first chapter. Concerning Judas, who, uh, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and he shared in our ministry. This was one of the guys that shared in spreading the kingdom with us. Can you believe it? Then, he, then Luke adds this parenthesis. With the payment he received, 30 pieces of silver for his wickedness, Judas indirectly bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. I know it says that he hung himself. Luke's a doctor. Luke's going to be specific. He couldn't have crucified himself, but another form of suicide was to fall on a stake. Judas may have fallen on a stake, and that would have explained why Luke, the doctor, wrote these particular words, giving the specifics about what happened when he died. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they call that field in their language Akeldama, which is the field of blood. It's talked about in Zechariah 11 and Jeremiah 19. It's the potter's field. It's where you bury foreigners, people outside the covenant. Verse 20, for, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, another book, may his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. In other words, let him be cut off, not listed among the righteous dead, Psalm 69. And may another take his place of leadership. That's the curse of a betrayer. It warrants replacement. And people would say, Peter, of all of the disciples, how could you point out somebody else? And Peter would say, hey, I was a temporary backslider, okay? I goofed up for a little, for a little while, but I got it right. I asked for forgiveness. Jesus forgave me. Judas was an apostate. It wasn't that Jesus chose him so that he could fall. He did that all on his own. He revealed his true nature by the extent of his betrayal. Just ask John in 1 John. He describes that. All I'm doing is recognizing a fulfillment of Scripture. Just like when David's friends became his enemies and needed to be replaced. Our friend has become our enemy, and he needs to be replaced. And so I'm appealing to Scripture to say, we've got to do this, guys. Besides that, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus told us that the apostles, us, the disciples, 12 of us, would stand in judgment over the house of Israel for the rejection of their Messiah. As a matter of fact, we're going to form the trans the, 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 uh, the foundation for everything the church believes. You can ask John about that. He may not know it yet. That won't happen for 30 years because he writes about it in Revelation. In other words, the 12 are significant in their minds. They have to have 12 to complete the witness because the 12 will stand in judgment, according to Jesus' own words in Matthew's gospel, over the house of Israel, over the 12 tribes, and according to the book of Revelation, they'll also form the foundation of the church. There, the 12 names will be written. We need 12, guys, to fulfill God's plan. There has to be the number 12. And, and Peter is recognizing that, this. He says, therefore, it's necessary for us to choose one of us who have been with us the whole time. The whole time that the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning with John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taking, taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So there's the qualifications. They've got to be a credible witness, an eyewitness, handpicked by Jesus. They have had to have seen his resurrection. So that's, if you call yourself an apostle, <laughs> in the most technical sense, uh, were you, did you walk with Jesus while he was on the earth, and did you see him actually, you know, after his resurrection? Uh, if not, you don't qualify as an apostle. So they nominated two men, Joseph, called um, Barsabbas, also known as Justice and Matthias, and they prayed, and they prayed. The Lord, uh, the Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you've chosen. It wasn't who they wanted to choose. They prayed, and they said, Lord, show us. 
Who's going to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs? So if you wonder where Judas is, I think Peter just answered it right there. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. Everybody was included in the process. But this was not an election about church management. This was to complete who would lead the witness. So they prayed. And then they used in Old Testament, there's continuity, an Old Testament practice to discern God's will that God had prescribed already. Two stones with two names, one on each stone in a container, and they throw them out. And in that way, they choose who it would be, and they take that as God's will being done. Leviticus 16, Joshua 14, 1 Chronicles 24 and 25, Nehemiah, Esther 9, Proverbs 16. The deal is, though, it's never used again after the coming of the Spirit to discern what God's will is. Isn't that a beautiful detail? Up until that point, all they had was a method to pray and try to discern what God's will is. After the Spirit comes, it tells me that every believer can know God's will and we don't have to shoot the dice to figure out what it is. What if, what if that was our testimony? What if we actually believed that Jesus was alive and well in the world? What if we actually believed that the Spirit could change us and that we could be part of the story? What if we really believed that we were the family of God on mission to bring the Savior to the world? What if we actually believe the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and gives us the power to witness? What if we really believed that every person matters in the process? What if we really took prayer seriously? What if we really believed that the kingdom of God, God's sovereign rule in the hearts of men was already here, but that we were waiting for our king to arrive any day? What if? What if we followed the model, being witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth? Concentric circles going out so that the gospel, and here's the analogy, goes from here in our heart, from the innermost parts of who we are to the outermost parts of the world. That's the flow. That's the invitation. That's the challenge. Can we set in this study and do what we actually read about in the book of Acts? Take the gospel from here to the world. It's not because we're so good. It's because the same spirit lives in us that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the same spirit that changed that raggedy bunch of disciples into the church that was unstoppable. So my challenge today, as I wrap this up, is the same as last time. To get out of our dry, our boring, our plastic pie-in-the-sky, do-your-own-thing religiosity, and allow ourselves to be changed as we study through this book. To join the story, a family on mission, to join history, redemptive history, and to keep the fire burning. And to not let it go out. To be empowered by the Spirit of God. And to take Jesus from here, out to there, to the world. What if we actually believed what we read in the Scriptures to be true in our own lives? What if we actually believed that in the witness of Jesus Christ in the world, that message is unstoppable and that we're messengers to take that message? What if we actually believe that? I don't think we believe it. Otherwise, we'd be doing it. What do you think? You tell me, our actions prove what we really believe. That's my challenge, and that's all I can leave you with today, because I'm sweating, and I think I've gone over time, but the clock is broken, so I really don't know. I don't care. That's the challenge. I mean, that's, that's from my heart, guys. I pray that as I read through this book, that fire in me is rekindled, that I actually believe this stuff all over again. That it goes a little bit deeper into my heart. Don't you feel that over time, maybe you've lost a little bit too? A little bit of the passion, a little bit of the belief? It's like you got it in your head, you know it, 
You know the stories. You know the whole deal. But the passion that comes from believing is evaporated. That's my challenge. Let's be challenged by the book and let's let the Holy Spirit change us. Now, that was a lot. <laughs> I know. I skipped over so much. You don't know. I want us to be challenged, really challenged by this book. To be different. To allow God to change us. And that's how I want to end this service today. Just praying that God would change us as we go through this book. We have a long journey. But that doesn't mean we have to wait until the end to change. If we change now, it'll come alive. And my sermons won't seem so long. That could be your motivation. Stand with me if you would. Lord, your word is so rich. May it penetrate into our hearts. As we read the stories of what you did so long ago, remind us that you're still doing that today in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. May this book challenge us like never before to remind us of what's true. To remind us that, Jesus, you're alive and that you've sent the Spirit to change us. So, Lord, change us. My heart for this church is that we would allow you to do that. That you would change our hearts. That we would be reminded of the, of the beauty of and the simplicity of the gospel message that changes men and women, changes the entire program in their life, changes the way they think, and look, makes sense of a messed up world and gives us hope for the future. May we remember everything that you've done for us. May we catch fire like the first believers who sensed that God was doing something phenomenal, supernatural. God, because you are, open our eyes to see that. And Lord, I pray that we would get on board with whatever it is that you're doing. And our hearts would be revived. And we would live again with the passion, the burning passion of the Holy Spirit. Working out your will in our lives. We're not casting dice. We're not throwing dice. We're not wondering what your will is. We know what your will is. God, I pray that we'd quit fighting about that and just get on with life life that you've given us, life in the Spirit. So God, I pray that every person in this room would be changed by your Spirit sooner rather than later. And Lord, if it has to start with me, let it start with me. In Jesus' name, amen.